I mentioned before how Exodus starts off by telling the reader that the Israelites had become fruitful and multiplied and filled the land, evoking Genesis 1.28, demonstrating that God's intention and his promise to Abraham uh, to give him many descendants and thereby bless the entire world is being fulfilled. Pharaoh, we also saw, is an anti-creation force in Exodus. As ruler and essentially god of the empire of Egypt, he is not pleased with this multiplying and spreading out in the earth. But when it comes to the creation theme in Exodus, there's more. The theme of creation and the creation events are actually woven throughout and entwined in this entire Exodus story. And I want to look at a few examples with you. First, if you remember back to Exodus 2, when Moses' mom gave birth to him, it reads there in 2-2, And the woman conceived and bore a son, and she saw that he was a fine baby. Well, this phrase here in Hebrew, literally, it reads like this. She saw him, that he was good. That's ki tov in Hebrew. Um, this language should remind you of something. When is the last time in your Bible reading that someone saw something that it was good? Well, it was the creation account in Genesis 1. It's regularly stated there that God saw it, that it was good. Now, this passage goes on to say, um, still talking about Moses' mother, when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket, or this Hebrew word is teva, made of bulrushes. Now we miss this in English, unfortunately, but this word for basket here, teva, is a very unique word. It really refers, it can refer to any type of container, and it occurs in only one other narrative in the entire Old Testament. It's, it's the word used to refer to the ark or the container that Noah built. God said to Noah, make yourself a teva of gopher wood. So Moses is put in a teva and then put in the waters of the Nile that are equivalent to death, as was Noah back in Genesis 6 through 8. Both are pulled out of those waters of death and God creates something anew through both of them. So let's keep these echoes of the creation narrative in mind as we go on to consider the plagues that we read about in Exodus 7 through 12. When Moses asks Pharaoh to let his people go, Pharaoh declines, and that leads to God sending a number of plagues upon Pharaoh and the land of Egypt. Okay, so we know the plagues are bad, right? Nothing good is going on there. But why these specific plagues? Um, did you wonder about this when you were reading the story? What, what's the point of each of these? Are they just random or are there patterns? Is there deeper meaning? Well, there's deeper meaning. <laughs> Let's look a little closer at some of the plagues. So you have them in sort of um, summarized version up on the screen, but these are in Exodus 7 through 12. So let me point out a few patterns to you. Notice the second and fourth plagues are frogs leaving the Nile River, coming out of the Nile and going into people's homes, beds, ovens, mixing bowls. And then swarms of flies that are normally outside are going into the house of the Egyptians. Now, no one is dying or getting sick here, it doesn't say, but what's going on? Is this just an inconvenience? Think about what Genesis 1 described God as doing in the beginning of creation. He took some chaotic, dark waters and created order. He created spheres and spaces and then filled those spaces with life, particular life forms that belonged in those spaces. What's happening here is a mixing up of spaces. Frogs and flies that belong outside in their spheres in nature are getting mixed up and coming inside, invading human space, filling houses where they aren't supposed to be. A similar thing happens in a few other plagues. So if we look at the first, third, and sixth, the Nile um, turns into blood. Dust turns into gnats. Soot turns into boils and sores on humans and animals. 
what's happening is that the order God created in nature is being undone. Things that are one thing are turning into another, right? When God created in Genesis 1, everything was separate. Remember, he kept saying, according to its kind, according to its kind, right? Um, So things are getting mixed up. Things that give life, like the Nile, are... Um, or are just part of the earth, like dust, are turning into things that could be harmful. This goes on with the deadly pestilence upon Egypt's livestock, hail striking down humans, animals, plants, shattering every tree, locusts covering the surface of the whole land so that the land was dark and they ate all the plants until nothing was left. Firstborn animals and children die. Children die. This is a lot of destruction and death. And notice that it's of all kinds of um, God's creation, right? People, yes. Also trees and plants are being uncreated, so to speak, by the hail and the locusts. Animals are being destroyed, as are the humans. In creation, in Genesis, God created life. And these plagues are the opposite. They're bringing death or the undoing of life. And finally, there's the ninth plague, which was darkness over the earth. So people couldn't see one another for three days. Again, this is the opposite of what was done in creation. There, where there was darkness, God spoke and said, let there be light. And there was light. What does this all mean? Well, Exodus begins with Pharaoh being anti-creation, being opposed to life as Yahweh intended. And the plagues, in part, are sort of a poetic justice to Pharaoh that say, okay, you don't like creation. You're against my creation. Well, I'll show you a world that has been uncreated. If you really despise my creation, then you can experience what it's like for me to undo it or uncreate it. Um, It's worth remembering, too, that as your textbook points out, that Pharaoh is not really just a man in this narrative. He is, but in ancient Egypt, he was also considered semi-divine while he was alive, and he was thought to be fully divine after death. Um, And he symbolized the entirety of the Egyptian gods. So this showdown is more about God versus another deity and not as much about God versus a human ruler. Yahweh, the God of Israel, is demonstrating that the entire Egyptian pantheon, the Egyptian empire, is powerless before him. So if the plagues are like an uncreation, what happens next? Well, the Israelites flee uh, and find themselves trapped between the approaching Egyptian army and a body of water. And Yahweh miraculously parts the waters of the sea and the Israelites walk through on dry ground. This is their liberation, deliverance, redemption. The second major theme of the Old Testament, it begins right here. And this redemption of his people from a death-dealing, oppressive empire is a new creation. There are a number of connections to Genesis 1 in the Hebrew here, but just notice that Genesis 1 began with chaotic waters, which God separated and ordered, right? And a similar thing happens here. God parts these waters that would lead to death, and instead, Israel walks through alive. The Lord tells Moses, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. This echoes Genesis 1, where God called the dry ground earth, and the waters were gathered together, and he called sea. This redemption is also envisioned as a creation or recreation event. It's about God creating this people whom he had already called back in Genesis. But because of the links with the creation of humanity in the very beginning, The story highlights that this isn't just about Israel. It's connected to God's intention for all of humanity. And a few new um, interesting things happen here. One is that Exodus 12, 38 states that a mixed crowd or a diverse crowd went with Israel. This is referring to the fact that it wasn't only Israelites who escaped, but probably slaves from other ethnic backgrounds as well who are here escaping with them, joining themselves to this people. Now, a second thing is that the promises to Abraham 
that were made by God and then reiterated to Isaac and Jacob that God was going to bless the world through Abraham's family. Those were essentially past promises and events for these people in Egypt. It was a promise made in the past that the people believed in the present. But in the Exodus event, God's people attached themselves to Yahweh in a profound new way. As your textbook writes, through the events at the sea, a new community has emerged for whom Yahweh is more than just the God of their ancestors. He's their God, too. Finally, this event demonstrates that God in, what God intended when he said that Abram's family would bless the earth. Now, to bless someone is to enable or empower them to fulfill God's intended purpose for them. And as God brings Israel out from under the oppression of Pharaoh's empire, Israel's mission becomes um, an exodus-shaped mission to bless people, enabling them to live into God's intentions for them by bringing life and not death to all creation. So Exodus begins with a Pharaoh and an empire that is anti-creation, anti-life, and that promotes oppression and death. And then the creator God shows Pharaoh what being anti-creation leads to. He shows him via the plagues what it's like for creation to be undone. And then he engages in a new act of creation, creating his people whom he will call to join his mission to restore creation as a whole. And your Easter egg for this week is to answer the two following questions. First, what things encouraged you in the Exodus 5 through 15 reading? And second, what things troubled you if there were anything that if there was anything that troubled you about the Exodus 5 through 15 reading?